What's going on guys? Dare here with Fantasy Football Advice coming at you with another Fantasy Football video. Today, it's Monday. You know what time it is. It's time to go over those hot waiver ads as we head into week four of the NFL season. Me personally, I can't believe how fast the time has gone by. By the end of this upcoming week, we'll be through nearly one quarter of the NFL season and with fantasy playoffs starting even sooner than that, if we're some of those teams that are starting 0-3, 1-2, let's use the results we've had throughout the season as well as this week to give us a good idea on if we should be able to make it into the playoffs easily or not. The last thing we want is to be a week or two away from actually making it into the playoffs and realize due to the strength of our division, we really had no chance. Remember, there will also be 17 weeks this season and no, I'm not talking that useless week 17 game. Depending on your league, you should have one extra week this year to make up any bad start you've had to the fantasy season. Just be sure to get ahead of it before it gets out of control and one way to turn around a struggling team, as we know, adding top players off free agency. I think we all know the one game-changing player we have this week and I'll get into it in a minute. It. But before we do, let's of course talk about our stat of the day. Yesterday's stat of the day was among the 11 wide receivers to finish the first two weeks with 20 or more targets, which player currently has the least amount of receptions? The correct answer was actually Marvin Jones, who had a pretty decent day against the Arizona Cardinals this past week. It was a difficult draw, but congratulations to D-Money, the first to get this right on YouTube. And as for Twitter, at Real Isaiah Smith. Once again, congratulations to both of you. But as for today's stat of the day, this one's going to consist of just the stats in week three, more specifically, rushing yards. In today's question, in my opinion, an easy one. It's which running back that had over 80 rushing yards in week three accomplished that goal with the least amount of rush attempts on the ground. Once again, that's which running back in week three to compile over 80 rushing yards accomplished that with the least amount of rushing attempts. Leave your answer in the comment section down below. We'll be happy to let you know who wins in tomorrow's video. All right, guys, without further ado, let's hop right into the waiver wire players. And I will let you know that we do, of course, have that high end player I was mentioning earlier. But outside of him, I do want to be up front with you guys. There are going to be a lot of repeat names. Some of the producers in the first few weeks, they've not only been able to put together a good matchup in one of the weeks so far this season, they've been doing it in multiple. So each time I'll make sure to include them in this video if their ownership percentage is low enough, if it makes sense, of course, and I do recommend them. And when going through today's video, setting everything up, I certainly saw a lot of repeat names that I was actually surprised that were still on the waivers. With that being said, though, and without further ado, let's hop right into the running back position. We're beginning with the top player to add at the running back position, that player being Chuba Hubbard. If you're not familiar with the name Chuba Hubbard, that's because he is a rookie this season drafted in the second round by the Carolina Panthers. Yes, that's right. We're talking about the backup for Christian McCaffrey, a player who I think we all saw had a hamstring injury. With his game being on Thursday night, all eyes were on him. It was a primetime game. There were no other games to distract you. And with this game being against the Houston Texans, a team that was actually without their starting quarterback, Tyrod Taylor, there really wasn't much to watch offensively. So as soon as Christian McCaffrey went down with an injury, of course, that was all the talk of the entire game. Chuba Hubbard, though, I do have to admit, when being thrust in the role, it didn't seem like the lights were too big for him. Yes, it was against the Houston Texans, not the scariest defense, in fact, one of the least scary defenses, but it's big shoes to fill if we're talking Christian McCaffrey, and obviously the responsibilities for a running back replacing Christian McCaffrey is going to consist of a lot more than an early down rusher replacing possibly Nick Chubb, and by the end of the game, Chuba Hubbard, he showed off his chops in both the receiving game as well as the run game, boasting 11 carries for over 55 yards, a really strong yards per carry average, but most importantly, importantly, of course, what Mike Davis did last year replacing Christian McCaffrey. It's that work in the receiving game that we're after. Hubbard, he received five targets, caught three of them, put up 27 receiving yards, another efficient output coming in with nine yards per reception. And while he didn't score, I think all of us left comfortable knowing that Chuba Hubbard was going to be the lead back moving forward. At that time, though, we didn't know exactly how long Christian McCaffrey was going to be out, the extent of his injury. But the word that we've received back right now is that he is going to be avoiding IR, a commitment that would guarantee he couldn't come back any sooner than three weeks and with them wanting to opt to avoid it, that does indicate that they're optimistic that potentially he could come back sooner than three weeks, which means anybody in a league where Chuba Hubbard is still available on the waiver wire, before you fully invest into him, just be aware that you may only have him for a few games, so don't go wasting 80% of your fab. What happens if Christian McCaffrey comes back? Hubbard goes back to being a backup, and you're left without a running back, one injury away from potentially losing your whole fantasy season with a lack of depth. And while much of that is speculation, of course, at this point, we don't have any additional information outside of that and why else would they skip placing him on the IR? If they knew he would be well over three weeks, it wouldn't make sense to cut it so short. So I think the prime candidate of somebody that is going to target Chuba Hubbard is going to be the Christian McCaffrey owner or somebody that can afford to trade for Christian McCaffrey while he's injured on the sideline. For the remainder of you that don't fit into either of those two categories, I recommend just putting in a modest bid. It's a short-term rental. Yes, Chuba Hubbard looked good, but he didn't look phenomenal. He's no Christian McCaffrey, of course. And in today's NFL, there's no guaranteeing anyone can stay healthy. Chuba Hubbard, could start
start for one game and get injured himself, meaning you virtually wasted every bit of investment you put into getting him off the waivers. And with it only being four weeks deep into the NFL season, I'm not willing to over invest into something I'm not gaining long term value from. With that being said, though, if you need an RB1 temporarily for a few weeks, as I mentioned, maybe cleaning up a slow start or some early injuries you sustained, getting your record back to be in playoff contention again by the time Christian McCaffrey comes back, I could see that being a good investment, maybe buying some time as you trade for another running back. In those cases, I can understand paying up for a player like Hubbard, but outside of that, I think maybe you should let him go if you really don't need him. All right, moving into the second highest ranked running back I have coming off the waivers this week, it's going to be Zach Moss of the Buffalo Bills. At this point, even hearing the name Zach Moss is a bit bittersweet because he's been a player I've been high on even when everyone else was down on him. Last season, of course, he was a player that we targeted in the draft process, drafted him in a lot of leagues. He was a late round running back with guaranteed volume. And unfortunately, due to his injury history and the injuries he sustained last season, he didn't get much field time. Even while looking like the better back, he was still overall a bust for fantasy. So heading into this season, starting off the season unhealthy, my expectations for him, they were much lower. While I was willing to invest a late round draft pick into him when he was a rookie, I figured there was a chance that he could stay healthy. Now heading into his second season, me feeling like I had already seen what he could provide for my roster with Devin Singletary also returning and virtually being the same situation and already being an offense in which was already top five in scoring. There were so many things that already went right with his situation in the season in which he disappointed me that even as a late round pick this year, I wasn't really feeling it. Now fast forward just a few weeks into the NFL season, Zach Moss has been playing some of his best football of his entire career and that's not an understatement. He's been involved in all areas of the field, that being the receiving game, the run game, the red zone, overall posting just under 90 yards from scrimmage, having no fewer than two receptions in each of his last two games, scoring in each contest as well. I can't say I'm surprised I've always liked his talent, just know that there are some red flags holding him back from potentially producing like this for the entire season, first of which he's splitting a backfield with Devin Singletary, and while he will play the 1A and get some of the most valuable work, that being the receiving and the red zone work, there are always going to be times where Devin Singletary gets the nod over him, and when those weeks inevitably come, there's no saying if you really need those fantasy points in order to beat your opponent or not. Having the option though, it's going to be out of your hands. Regardless though, as mentioned, I do have him ranked as the second highest running back because the production he's getting, you're not able to find that for many running backs in the league, let alone somebody you're able to get off of waivers. Top 20 production, it doesn't grow on trees. And with Zach Moss being readily available for most people out there, I say, hey, if you've had an injury to your running back position, maybe you even lost Christian McCaffrey, let this be a backup plan, another running back that you target to potentially replace him temporarily. And when I say temporarily, it's because I don't want you to hold your breath and get your hopes up that he's going to play for you for the entire season. Because not only does missing time due to injuries date back to last season, but it's something that's plagued him throughout his entire career. All right, moving into the third running back, it's one that I've definitely grown more accustomed to. It's Cordero Patterson of the Atlanta Falcons. I will admit that at first, I wasn't very high on him because I did have shares of Mike Davis. Me seeing him as more of a gadget player, someone closer to Percy Harvin than an actual running back, I didn't really value that as much as I would another running back, someone similar to Zach Moss. Over three weeks though, I've seen him play very consistently and have a consistent role in his offense. Also with most of his work coming in the receiving game, his week to week consistency is actually better than a lot of running backs out there. And despite him not meeting all of the guidelines for a typical running back, you'd be surprised at how much consistent work he's getting on the ground as well. No fewer than seven carries in any game so far this season, seven targets in both of his most recent games as well. And if you watch any of the Atlanta Falcons games, you know that they're desperately looking for another player and a playmaker to consistently step up. So far, Cordero Patterson has been that guy. And with Russell Gage already out with an injury, Mike Davis not looking great himself, Calvin Ridley even struggling himself in this offense, I find it very difficult to believe that they're going to be able to move away from Cordero Patterson without replacing it with production from somewhere else. And when you look around at this offense, there really aren't any other players to potentially fill that role. All right, moving into the fourth running back and what a good week for running backs it is because we have Sony Michel of the LA Rams. As many, if not all of you know, Daryl Henderson, he did go down with an injury. Not too surprising him being a smaller size running back, someone who is already dealing with injuries in preseason, losing out on Cam Akers and having to step into a larger role. An injury for Daryl Henderson, somebody who is nearly leading the league when it comes to volume through the first few weeks. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that adding up to an injury. Sony Michel, though, a player coming from New England in a trade, the presumed backup. I wasn't ever so high on him in the pre-draft process. Him being a very, very one-dimensional running back, not getting opportunities in the receiving game in New England, and we all know that they love passing to the running back position, so if he had the chops, they likely would have given him opportunities. Sony Michel himself, always massively inefficient, and with him being a first-round talent, somebody invested very highly in by the New England Patriots, them being so willing to trade him away for next to nothing, never fully giving him the full reins to the offense, and whenever he did get opportunities, he couldn't stay healthy for very long. There wasn't much to get very excited about, 
about with him joining the team so late just a few weeks before the season started having to learn a new offense a Sean McVay offense while the upside was there it's not the easiest offense to pick up on but as soon as Daryl Henderson went out the first game we saw Sony Michelle completely step in get that workhorse role not only getting that work on the ground but most importantly getting four targets in the process and from what we've seen from the LA Rams offense led by Sean McVay I want every piece I possibly can get of this offense and with Sony Michelle getting a workhorse role in it I don't care who it is I want a piece of it there's no saying exactly how long until Daryl Henderson returns but I presume even when he does return Sony Michelle will at least retain somewhat of a significant role that being determined by how well he plays in the absence of Henderson which so far he's been playing pretty fine over the past two weeks in this offense he's received a total of 34 targets an average of 17 per game a larger workload than nearly any running back in the entire league and with it being on the Rams offense you really couldn't ask for anything better grab him off waivers the investment it may seem temporary but it's one that comes with at least a diminished role when Henderson returns and with him still being undersized they're only going to be more motivated to give away touches to Sony and if not he's just going to get injured again so it's all positive signs for the potential workload and future of Sony Michelle in one of the best offenses in the league all right these next two running backs I'm really not high on consider them honorable mentions for starters we have Peyton Barber he's joined the Las Vegas Raiders taking over for the injured Josh Jacobs an overall surprising signing for me for many reasons first off they have Kenyon Drake they brought him in this offseason presumably to play the backup running back role the way I see it it's not like Josh Jacobs had a season ending injury towards ACL in which case I could understand wanting to get Kenyon Drake some backup the same thing they did with Daryl Henderson bringing in Sony Michelle but with his injury being more temporary you would think that they would just give the reins to Kenyon Drake for a short period of time as opposed to what they did which was bring in a running back that's not familiar with the offense has to learn everything from scratch I quite literally almost couldn't believe it myself especially when they brought the name up Peyton Barber a player that was extremely inefficient with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers not showing to be proficient on the ground or through the air not in short yardage I can't remember a time in which he actually surprised me or shocked me with his positive production the only time I can admit that he has was in this game for the Raiders 23 carries 111 yards even scoring a touchdown on top of that five targets three receptions for 31 yards we're talking over 10 yards per reception here so he just completely dominated he was receiving a massive workload and while yes they probably don't have any interest in his long-term future so in theory you can give him as many touches as you want but the whole thing is just super weird to me at this point though you have to go with the hot hand you have to go with the volume and Peyton Barber not only appears to be the guy he is the guy so if you're in desperate need of a running back this is just another name to throw in the hat of running backs that you could get off waivers start this upcoming week and be really happy with the production from it all right guys this last running back is just a familiar name for you from a years back with Melvin Gordon on the Denver Broncos it's Royce Freeman and some of you out there may be wondering what roster he's on right now and he is a backup and it's the backup to Christian McCaffrey actually right now it's the backup to Chuba Hubbard and as mentioned I'm not going to harp on this one we already have a history knowing what Royce Freeman brings to the table he is a running back that is solid on the ground but not great he's okay in short yardage but also not excellent he can get it done in the receiving game but he's not going to wow you and overall he is going to be a bit more injury prone than most other running backs but with him being on an offense with a role recently vacated by Christian McCaffrey us not knowing for certain exactly how good Chuba Hubbard is and Hubbard always has the risk of getting injured getting shares and investments in Royce Freeman there is always that small percentage chance that it does end up working out for you I'm not holding my breath though but it is worth the shot like I mentioned he's ranked all the way down here as an honorable mention so nobody you should count on but if you do have extra roster spots and just want to add additional running back depth don't be afraid to pull the trigger on Royce Freeman all right guys we're moving over to the wide receiver position and this is an area where I had mentioned initially that there was a lot of repeat names as for why the only explanation is that people didn't take them off the waiver wire last week not believing in them being anything further than a one-week wonder and speaking of one-week wonders we potentially have a two-week wonder here with Rondell Moore this is a player drafted in the second round by the Arizona Cardinals a team that has a pretty good eye for wide receiver talent and in the first two games he competed with the best of them receiving five targets in week one catching four of them for 68 yards and then followed that up with week two with an even better performance even scoring a touchdown he saw an increase in targets going from five up to eight catching seven of them so even posting a better catch rate improving in all areas and turned his just under 70 receiving yards into well over 100 in week two for week three it seemed like he was primed for excellence not only being a player that I grabbed off of waivers but one that I felt confident I could start in my lineup then unfortunately against the Jacksonville Jaguars one of the easiest passing defenses in the entire league he completely posted a dud meanwhile Christian Kirk DeAndre Hopkins two players that had more of an up they completely shined but for that we're seeing Rondell Moore find his way to free agency and find his way to the waivers I recommend picking him up the upside we saw from him in the first two weeks it's more than worth a roster spot and with DeAndre Hopkins currently dealing with an injury there is a chance 
he potentially misses a stretch of time and if that happens Rondo Moore could potentially push for wide receiver one numbers while it's largely a stretch it's within his range of outcomes he was already a top 20 wide receiver currently still stands as a top 20 wide receiver so it's no wonder why he ranks at the top of the wide receiver list for me this week and if he's available make sure to grab him off waivers behind him we have a lot of people's favorite target at the wide receiver position it's Emmanuel Sanders Sanders being a player that I was very high on throughout this draft process as we know the Buffalo Bills they were very high on Emmanuel Sanders themselves not just for this past offseason but in other off seasons unfortunately his prior commitments his contracts they didn't allow him to go and play for the Buffalo Bills but as soon as he did get out of his contract they were the first team to go ahead and sign him that right there we knew that the team had mutual interest as well as he did and with Emmanuel Sanders every time we've seen him on the field lastly with the San Francisco 49ers he's always looked like he still had some juice left and pairing him with one of the most talented quarterbacks in the league Josh Allen one with a very strong arm a quarterback that will get them in scoring position frequently the upside was always there we just had to wait and see if he could put it all together in week three together it was all put Sanders posting over 25 fantasy points proving to be the clear third option in this passing offense behind Stephon Diggs no signs of slowing down so as long as he can stay healthy Josh Allen can stay healthy I wouldn't be surprised if Emmanuel Sanders is a top 30 receiver for the remainder of the year we have two wide receivers left and the first one it shouldn't surprise you it's a familiar name it's Quintez Cephas this is a player that a lot of people left on waivers after producing very solid in week one and week two I know it may seem like a bit of a surprise on why I'm asking you to add him after a bust week but I believe in the talent I've continued to do more research on him and I feel very confident in his season-long value as well as the receivers in Detroit they continue to drop like flies the Detroit Lions offense and defense the team as a whole it's also very surprising to see them have so much success yes they're not putting it together and they're ending in losses but they're playing very close games very close games that have always had positive passing game scripts Jared Goff playing some of his better football we've seen out of him very surprising since he's not tied to Sean McVay but who's asking questions here Quintez Cephas he's not going to be the most popular player added off free agency I wouldn't be surprised for many people who put him in in this positive matchup potentially getting burned by him if that happened to many fantasy owners out there you better believe some of them will take it out on him send him to the waivers showing no interest in him likely for the remainder of the year or until he proves himself back otherwise meanwhile I'm not the type to overreact to one game in this case I overreact to two that's as many games as he's produced so far this season but regardless I've seen enough from this offense it's more of a bet on the offense as opposed to in him yes it's a bet in him as well but they almost beat the Baltimore Ravens had it not been for a record-breaking field goal and that to me that's a win in itself all right guys we're moving into the final wide receiver target we have for the day as mentioned earlier this was a much stronger running back day but in this one another familiar name we have Tim Patrick of the Denver Broncos a player that a lot of people knew had potential as soon as Jerry Judy went down with an injury the only issue of course Cortland Sutton the first game after Jerry Judy was out of the lineup he completely popped off while Tim Patrick he had himself a fine game as well in the first game without Jerry Judy his 37 yards and a receiving touchdown failed in comparison to what Cortland Sutton was able to put up so his fantasy day it largely went unnoticed some people added him others didn't so while he may not be fully available for you if you do see him still on your waivers I would definitely recommend adding him Cortland Sutton we've seen him as recent as last season go down with a season ending injury Tim Patrick being the clear wide receiver behind him that gives him some handcuff value handcuff value we've already seen paid dividends to both Cortland Sutton as well as Tim Patrick getting the trickle down effect not only posting strong production in that first game but actually following up the second game with even better production only by a hair though an additional reception a few more receiving yards but he still scored a touchdown now that makes two in a row and with the offense of the Denver Broncos being much better than a lot of people give it credit for Tim Patrick a receiver that largely goes unnoticed by many is somebody that could quietly produce for your team if you're desperate to fill your wide receiver position all right guys we're over to the tight end position and we only have two today the first one it's been a while since we've been able to mention him but it's Tyler Conklin of the Minnesota Vikings as we know Kirk Cousins he's been playing out of his mind I'm not going to throw things like MVP out there because no I don't think he's playing MVP caliber but it's certainly some of his best football we've ever seen him play of his career he's been defeating every opponent he was just in a shootout or what was expected to be a shootout against Russell Wilson many people of course would have pegged Wilson to be the winner and come out on top in that matchup but Kirk Cousins he proved otherwise not only is Justin Jefferson having success but Adam Thielen as well Adam Thielen as we know he was a bit hit or miss last season but it doesn't end there KJ Osborne a unknown wide receiver he's had an excess of production just because Kirk Cousins is distributing the ball to him as well literally anybody that can run a route and anyone that can catch a ball he's putting it right in the bread basket so it doesn't take much to have success on this offense Tyler Conklin another player that just proved that his first game actually receiving a full workload we're talking at the tight end position he received eight targets catching seven of them posting 70 receiving yards and a scoring touchdown I strongly believe that with the success Kirk Cousins had and his recent success when 
targeting Conklin. This is going to be a role that they will continue to expand on. And so far, what we've seen from Cousins when expanding on any roles for any wide receivers, they've continued to have success and have been starters from that point forward. So Tyler Conklin being at a position that doesn't require as much volume to have success, this is only going to work in his benefit. So if you're one of those TE needy teams, maybe you have someone like Tyler Higby, Gerald Everett. I strongly believe anybody taking a shot on Tyler Conklin over those two players has a strong chance of it paying dividends for them for the remainder of the season. All right, guys, the final player we have is the Pittsburgh Steelers tight end. It's Pat Fryermouth. Forgive me if I said it incorrectly. I'm not too familiar with him as a player, but one thing that I've noticed being a Deontay Johnson owner is that as soon as he was out of the lineup, we instantly saw the targets that went to him and Najee Harris completely expand. It makes sense though. They want to continue to target someone in the short passing game. Ben Roethlisberger not quite having the arm he used to. And with him being a big body, much like Deontay Johnson as well, it was a natural fit to go from one to the other. As mentioned with Tyler Conklin, the tight end position, it doesn't require as much volume. So it doesn't take much to be rosterable as well as startable. And with me being somebody who struggles at the tight end position often in leagues, I'm willing to take shots on players that I've seen upside with. And what I saw from him in a game on Sunday that wasn't ideal, it still showed much more signs of life than I've been getting out of my tight end position lately. And I really have nothing to lose. I plan on taking a shot on both him and Conklin and ultimately playing the best option of the three. But guys, that's going to do it for this video. We really hope you enjoyed. If you did, how about hitting that like button? If you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. We thank you all for watching. We'll catch you on the next one.